Okay, so then quickly I'm going to read out my abstract because I forgot to print it out for all of you. Uh, my paper for senior year project analyzes what exactly makes the Hunger Games and other young adult literature good, popular. By reading critics' reviews, reports about young adult literature, and reports about reading in general, I was able to disassemble the Hunger Games and figure out why it has become so addictive for so many people, including myself. My actual project for SYP was to write a collection of short stories. I called the process Writing Without Knowing How. It is so appropriately titled because writing short stories, or any creative fiction for that matter, is completely foreign to me. I have a basic knowledge of how to write and I have a strong imagination, so I decided to write a collection of short stories. I chose short stories because there are so many styles to play around with. I figured that because I don't know all that much about writing, I had freed myself up to play with style, voice, and other aspects of writing that usually stay constant for an author's writing style. Before I get, begin my presentation, I should make it clear that I do not consider myself an author, at least not yet. I think that to become an author you need to be published and most importantly you need to have an editor. Nobody else read any of the stories I wrote until I decided that I was finished writing them. So really all I am is a high school student who has decided, oh nope, is a high school student who is trying his hand at writing fiction. I'm no more an author than a culinary student is a chef. I'm merely a writer, nothing more. I'm no more an author than a culinary student is a chef. I'm merely a writer, nothing more. So that is that. Gonna go Back to the wiki home. Bring that down. Come on in. Okay. Um, so, like the abstract said, my SYP, like the actual project, well, I entitled it Writing Without Knowing How. Um, I, like I said in the abstract, basically wrote a collection of short stories um, and you know, didn't really focus that all that much on what other people were going to think about it. The only story that I had someone else read was Mr. Peter Goddard, who read one of my stories that changed completely from what he read. Um, I deleted three fifths of it and just changed the rest of the story. Um, so what I'm going to do first is I'm going to read. Uh, one of the short stories that I wrote, and it is called Caterpillar, and I'm not going to give a summary of what it is about, because you will find out. Okay. If you were an outsider looking at my family's house while I was growing up, you would have thought that I was an only child. One report card hanging up on the fridge, one child in the family portraits, one bedroom made up with the belongings of one child, and several photo albums dedicated to just one child. Nobody would blame you for assuming that I had no siblings. In fact, this is what everyone in the world assumed, except for two key people, my parents. For 15 years of my life, I was the only child my parents had to look after. I had no siblings and wanted none either. Then one day in my freshman year of high school, my parents called me out of class. My mom was wearing the happiest grin I had ever seen on a human being. She was beaming like a light shining down from heaven. My father, on the other hand, was trying to contain his giddiness. I could tell that he was happy, though, because there was a giggle escaping through his usually stoic demeanor. I walked up to the car that they were blocking the back windows of and asked them what was going on. Son, my dad started, we have a new addition to our family. I was confused. But, Mom, you weren't pregnant. How could you have... I was interrupted by the elated giggles of my parents. I knew he wouldn't guess, my mom squealed. Should we tell him? Yes, I demanded, growing more annoyed than confused. Okay, son, we adopted. They paused. I swear, that, I swear they thought that for every second they prolonged telling me what kind of child they adopted, a thousand dollars would be deposited into their bank account. Eventually the pause got too long. You adopted, I say, thinking that perhaps they forgot they were giving me news. My mother and father were never much, were never much for theatrics, but I guess they were very excited about this moment. They looked to at each other, jumped to the side, put their arms in a very presentational pose, and screamed simultaneously, A puppy! My excitement did not increase. You mean you bought a puppy? No, we adopted it, got it from the animal shelter. It was going to be put down tomorrow, and we saved its life. I don't remember which parent said this, so I assume that it was simultaneous. Oh. Uh, okay. Why don't you take a look at it before we head home to get the house ready, my mother asked. This was her way of commanding me to look at their new puppy, and her way of telling me that I was going to have to clean the house. I approached the car apprehensively. I pretended like there was going to be a monster inside just to make my parents angry. 
I think they thought that I was trying to play along with them, so they just got happier. I peeked through the window and saw only a pile of small gray blankets. The cheap, thin, scratchy kind that you get at cheap motels that you get bed bugs from. Where's the dog? I asked. Don't be ridiculous, my dad exclaimed. He's right there. I look through the windows again and see only a pile of blankets. I concentrate really hard just to humor my parents, and then I see the blankets move. I watched in horror as the laundry pile transformed into a living, breathing thing. A gray head emerged from the heap and extended itself forward, opening its long jaws to unleash a discolored tongue that licks what I can only assume is a snout. A small, thin, scrawny tail thumps against the black vinyl seats of our family's station wagon, polluting the air with individual strands of dog hair that detach from the dog with even the slightest movement. It tries to support itself on its front legs, but is only able to push itself into the door. The sudden movement frightens me, and I stumble backward and fall onto the concrete. What is that? I wonder loudly. That's Mr. Churchill, your new brother. My parents will tell you that at this point, point I fainted. They are lying and being, being overly dramatic. I didn't faint. I stood up and walked back to math class. After a few days, uh, sorry, um, I woke up the next morning, threw over my covers, threw my feet over the side of my bed, hopped off my bed, and stepped on Mr. Churchill. He yelped in pain and booked it out of the room, leaving a trail of urine behind him. My parents, as my punishment for scaring Mr. Churchill, made me clean it up. After a few days, my parents decided that the name Mr. Churchill was not so appropriate for their new favorite family member. A family meeting was called, and so began the great name debate. My parents kept me home for hours as I listened to them fight over names that they liked. My mother wanted Julius, but my dad thought that it was too Roman. My dad wanted Pepperoni, but my mom decided that it was far too Roman. Name suggestions flew around the room. Every so often they would ask me which name I preferred, but I would just look at the dog and say, how can you look at it and think anything other than dust? They disregarded most of my comments. Eventually it was decided that the name best suited to my new roommate was Caterpillar. I never really grew to like Caterpillar. My parents, though, still treated him as if he was their newborn baby boy. They walked him every three hours on the dot. They kept his food and water dish constantly filled because they found out they could not bottle feed dogs. When he started to go to the bathroom indoors, they shrieked with pleasure and snapped photographs for an album they called Doggy and Me. Then they made me clean it up. A photograph of him replaced the family portrait. His favorite cookies were purchased instead of mine and he was put into the most expensive puppy private school that the crazy people who raised me could afford. On the first day of puppy school, the entire family piled into the station wagon. My dad respectfully requested that I sit in the back because Caterpillar's Crete would slide to and fro back there, but in the second row, we can seat belt him so he's safe. When we arrived at the building, it occurred to me for the first time that my parents were not the only ones like this. Amid the freaks of the dog school stood one man in his early 20s who seemed the least bit sane. He was wearing a backpack, a pink polo shirt, blue shorts with green and red plaid, and boat shoes. I approached him and said, weird, huh? He didn't respond, but looked my way, so I clarified, all these people trying to get a good education for their pets. It seems like a waste. He gave me a good, hard glare, and then turned on his heel and walked away. On his back, where his backpack should have been, there was a chihuahua harnessed to his backside by several enforced straps. When it came time for registration, my parents eagerly approached the front desk. Name? Caterpillar, my mother answered. Caterpillar Simmons. I hadn't been aware that the dog took our last name. I guess it makes sense. What if there had been another caterpillar in his class? Breed? Mixed. If the receptionist had looked at the thing that my father was holding in his arms, she would have known to write down monster. Age? Seven. I watched as the large Asian woman behind the front desk looked at my parents in confusion. Months? Nope. Years. Seven years. Uh, I'm sorry, ma'am, but I'm afraid I didn't listen to the rest of the receptionist's sentence. I stopped listening because when I looked at the faces of my parents, I got worried. My father's face was growing a shade of pure red that I was sure only existed in cartoons. A muscle in his neck was protruding so far from its normal resting place that I think it might have seceded from the rest of his body. My mother had the blank stare of devastation on her face that only mothers can hear when they that only mothers can get when they hear that their child is not good enough. There was nothing she was focusing on, nothing she wanted to say, nothing that she could register. She only just got it together in time to cover Caterpillar's ears before he heard the large Asian woman finish her sentence with the words that usually scare only middle-aged women, too old. 
This tore my family apart the way that a miscarriage tears apart a pair of newlyweds. My mother could barely look at my father when he was even home. He spent most of his nights out drinking far past when the rest of our family had gone to sleep. So the duty to care for Caterpillar had fallen to me. It wasn't enough that this mutt had taken my place in the family. It wasn't enough that it caused the end of my parents' relationship. It isn't enough that the one time a girl came over to my house it scared her away by peeing on her shoes and then eating them. No. He had to take everything from me. Well, this time I wouldn't have it. This time, Caterpillar was on his own. This, of course, was not true. I couldn't just let the thing die, so I fed it, groomed it, walked it every once in a while, and basically just let it live a separate existence. Our only connection was that we slept, that, was that we slept in the same room. Then one day, my parents called a family meeting. My mom and down sat me down. My mom and dad sat me down in the big armchair in the living room. Caterpillar tried to jump up on my lap, but he smelled, so I pushed him back onto the floor. He fell on his back and scrambled to get up, so I chuckled to myself quietly. Son, Caterpillar. My father started to his children. We want you two to know that what I'm about to tell you is neither of your faults. Sometimes things just don't work out between a husband and a wife. What your father's trying to say is, we're getting a divorce. This didn't come as a shop shock to me, so I was able to keep it together. I guess, though, that my parents thought that Caterpillar was upset because they both immediately started to shower him with affection. They even got him a new toy. I sighed, walked upstairs, and played on my gaming console that had been outdated for four years. My parents had been separated three years by my last year of high school. They met up on graduation day, sat next to each other like I made them promise they would, and watched me receive my diploma. As I shook my principal's hands and looked where I, was, where I knew my parents would be, they both shot me glares the likes of which I had never seen, nor will ever see again. As I walked off the stage, I got worried. Had they found my alcohol? Had they found my porn magazines? I felt the color rush from my face. Had they found my bong? As I walked toward them, they grow ever angrier, and when I finally reached them, my dad started yelling, Where on earth is Caterpillar? I I'm sorry, I... What? My mother chimed in. I left for work this morning and said to you, Don't forget about the dog, and you said that you wouldn't. Where is he? He's at home, isn't he? Suddenly I got worried. Had I forgotten to feed him? Did he escape and get hit by a car? What could I possibly have done to get them this mad? Yes, he's at home. Why is he not here? This was the straw that broke the camel's back. Caterpillar had ruined, my, had ruined my high school experience and my parents' relationship. I had to take care of him and let him sleep in my room for four excruciating years. This was it. Fuck your dog! People around us looked at me. Excuse me? Fuck Caterpillar! You heard me! That dog has done nothing but cause this family trouble, and you want him at my graduation? I continued to lay into my parents, forcing four years of hatred for this animal in one moment. A teacher had to ask us to move our argument elsewhere because we were ruining graduation for the rest of the families. When I had finished, my parents gave, both gave me a big hug, apologized, and I expected everything to go back to the way it was before we got this sad excuse for an animal. They didn't. My father moved back into the house and my parents got back together, but they still cared for that dog more than anything in the world. I had learned to deal with it, so I continued to let them have their time with Caterpillar. Then as summer ended and I moved off to school, I realized something. When I left for college, I thought that I disliked Caterpillar. I didn't think that I would long for the frequent bathroom trips he would take in the middle of the night, the way he smelled after he snuck into the shower with me, the way his rough, slimy tongue felt against my cheek in the morning, or the way that his farts would stink up a room. But after that first week in my college dorm room with my first human roommate, I realized that my parents had gotten him to prepare me for college. I was right, I still hated Caterpillar, but my parents had gotten him for the right reasons. I called them at the beginning of my second week to thank them for what they had done. I told them that I figured it out and I was glad that they had done this for me. It was really helping me through these first few tough weeks. My dad responded, well, I'm not sure how it helped, but I'll tell your mom. Hey, honey. Moments later, my mother was on the phone. She said, Oh, sweetie, I'm so glad that you're on board with the new room for Caterpillar. Don't worry, though. We'll pay for the cost of the hotel you stay at when you come home for Caterpillar's birthday. And that is Caterpillar. Um, so, specific, uh, specific, I'll talk specifically about Caterpillar for a little bit. Um, Caterpillar, my idea for this story was, um, you know, I thought, wouldn't it be funny if parents loved a dog more than they loved their children. And, I mean, I think it was. 
so I sat down and I wrote this story. Um, my process with writing stories is that I'll sit down, I'll write the first draft, and you know that'll be it. I do the first draft entirely in one sitting, and you know I don't think about it for three hours, or maybe I don't think about it for you know a week and a half. Um, with Caterpillar specifically, I thought about it the next three hours, like three hours from when I stopped writing it. Um, I love this short story. Uh, I think it's funny. Um, some people think it's kind of dark because it, you know, it ruins the parent's relationship, but it's for a ridiculous reason. Um, and then also specific to Caterpillar, uh, this story was hard for me to end. It was hard for me to find a conclusion to this story. Um, what I do when I write is I'll sit down and I'll just write until the story's over. I don't have a plot planned out. Sometimes I'll just go off a first sentence of a story that I thought up that I think would be cool. Um, and with Caterpillar, I just had the basic idea of parents loving a dog more than their kids. So what I had to do for this story is I had to borrow a concept from sketch comedy. Sketch comedy is something that I got into my junior year of high school. And uh, the concept of sketch comedy is, can I write on the board? Um, so basically, can uh, you guys see this? So basically in sketch comedy, um, each part of a sketch is a beat. And so the first beat will start here, and it'll be funny. The second beat will go here, and it'll be very funny. The third beat will be up here, and it's you know almost at the point of no return. And then what you do for a cap is you either reverse it, so it comes back down, and it's you know an example of a reversal is um, Say a fireman who's ignoring a fire because he's talking to, uh, you know, some other family that he met would suddenly turn around and say, "Why are you distracting me? There's a fire over here. I have to put out." Um, but what I chose with this story, that if you're thinking about it as a sketch, is I chose to cap it, which is where you take it to the point where it is the most ridiculous. Uh, nothing can be. You know, nothing can go further than what's already happened. Um, and that's what I did for this story, because I thought, I wrote that line, and I kept writing. And then I read through the story again, and I thought, what could possibly be more ridiculous than parents giving up their son's room for their dog? Um, the story continued in the first draft. Uh, I had Caterpillar, you know, after the son graduates college, Caterpillar's there. Um, seeing his friend at his first graduation, uh, second graduation. And uh, then eventually Caterpillar dies, and he, you know, the son comes back for the funeral, and there's this whole exchange between him and the parents. Uh, I decided that this was better. Um, I like leaving it up to the imagination of the reader to uh, figure out what happens next. And you know, I, just, I enjoyed uh, incorporating some of what I love into some of what I'm starting to love more. Um, so my writing process with most of my stories, uh, like I said, is a very, you know, it's a very consistent thing. It's not a very efficient process, but it's very consistent. And what I mean by it's not very efficient is sometimes sitting down and writing the first draft of a story in one sitting is incredibly difficult because I'll have this great idea, or what I think in my mind is a great idea. I'll sit down and I'll write the first draft. Maybe I'll get a page and a half in, and I'll think, this is bad. This isn't a good idea. I either need to change this completely or choose another idea, which I did several times. Um, there are three or four ideas that I had that I just said, whoa, this is not making a good story. Oh, and I just threw it away completely. Um, I kept the idea on my wiki, which I guess this would be a good time to show you all of the ideas. So what I did when I had an idea for a sketch, or sorry, for a story, in the mindset of sketch comedy, is that I would write it down on a note in my phone, and then once or twice a week I would transfer them on here. Um, what I would do when I started writing a story is I would bring it down to the current projects, and then when I finish it, I would bring it down here. And I would post it with, you guys can see this, right? Uh, I would post it with the original idea, and then what it is after. Some ideas don't change that much. Like, uh, Fire is a story that I wrote when I was in New Orleans. And I thought, you know, I'm down here, I'm in this great city, and I'm going to write something that is inspired by this. And I was sitting, 
um, in a yard outside the church we were staying at, and there was a hospital right nearby. And so there were always ambulances coming in and out, in and out, in and out. There were always sirens blaring. So I heard a siren, and so I just started writing. And the first line of this story is, um, the first time I heard a siren was when I was eight years old, and I just kept writing. And that story you know, couldn't really change that much from the original idea, because there was no original idea. The original idea was a noise. Um, a story that changed a lot through my editing process was Fault. This is the story that Mr. Peter Goddard read. Um, my idea was that I would take the way that 9-11 affected America, the way that we increased our security, um, we had a different outlook on the rest of the world, and I would apply that to an event that changes you know, a teenager's life and how they see their community. Um, so I wrote a little essay at the beginning about 9-11 um, and about how I didn't, un how the character in the story didn't understand how, why someone could cl would claim responsibility. Because they remember this early memory, which is a memory that I borrowed from myself, about hearing that on the, the, the September 11th, that um, a terrorist cell named Al Qaeda is claiming responsibility for the terrorist attacks. And I didn't really understand why someone would claim responsibility for something so terrible that happened. Um, the character in the story doesn't either. But the character in the story uh, then you know, has this interact relationship with this girl who eventually commits suicide. Um, so it, writing Fault was horrible. I felt like a terrible person after I wrote it. I felt gross. I didn't like myself. I didn't like that I could write something like this. Um, but I thought it was, I think it's a good story because something that always interests me is a story where you can hate the protagonist. Um, an example of this, uh, for me at least, is Catcher in the Rye. I love the story, not a huge fan of Holden Caulfield. Um, uh, another example is a short story. Um, uh, I for, the name of it is escaping me at this moment. It's about uh, a woman who has a long-standing friendship with a, a blind man. And the blind man comes over for dinner one night. Cathedral. Cathedral. Um, and uh, you know, the main character in that, it's written in the first person, I believe. The main character in that is not likable. And I love that. I love that idea. Um, so I borrowed it, and I wrote Fault. Uh, after I wrote the first draft of Fault, I cut off the first three-fifths. And I left it just where a main character drives a girl to suicide and doesn't see can't connect himself to it uh, for, one reason or, for one reason or another. Um, and this brings me to my editing process. My editing process was long, editing and revising was long, and it was extremely inefficient. Because I, I, what I did in writing without knowing how, which is what I call this project again, um, I was the only one to look at the stories until they were published and on my wiki. No one else had access to these unless I sent them out to them. And so what I would do is I would write it, I would print it out, and I would look at it however long after I finished writing it. And I would just sit there, sit down with my pen, get at my desk, and correct, and change, and move. And it's especially inefficient because I would do it on paper, and then I would have to transfer it onto my computer, uh, which I learned is hard. Um, and I would do this, you know, seven or eight times until I could read the story through and say, good, this is good enough. It, that was either until I could find no more changes to make or until the changes that I found I ignored. Um, because from draft to draft, I would change things back. Like in Caterpillar, um, I changed, there's one line of dialogue that I changed, which is, uh, that's Mr. Churchill, your new brother. That line went from, that's Mr. Churchill, your new brother, to that's Mr. Churchill, uh, our new dog, to that's Mr. Churchill, your new brother, to that's Mr. Churchill, our new dog, and back to that's Mr. Churchill, your new brother. Um, there were some things I was just so indecisive about that I thought after my last draft, this is, I'll leave this like this. I'm not going to decide on something that I like, so I'll leave it here. Um, that varied from story to story. Uh, there are substantial parts of I'll just use Caterpillar as an example because you've heard it, uh, that I changed. Um, like in my first draft, there was, uh, the name didn't change from Mr. Churchill to Caterpillar. I thought that it would be funny 
if you know the name changed because they decided that it wasn't good enough for the dog. The dog needed something better. Um, and I also just thought that I didn't like writing Mr. Churchill throughout the rest of the story. I thought that Caterpillar was nicer. Um, so that was a little bit selfish on my part. Uh, so I'm going to real quick run through my stories and I'm going to describe them. Missing, uh, the idea for missing is an idea that I had uh, last year, uh, my junior year. I didn't know how I wanted to write it because I had, hadn't become interested in short stories yet. Um, I didn't really know what to do with it. The original idea was two best friends have different views on the friendship and the boy kills the girl's fiance because he thinks she's in love with him. Uh, so I tried writing this play over the summer as a sh I tried writing this as a short play to submit to the Playwrights Festival, which is uh, something that Theater Inc. does. Students can write uh, 10 minute plays and then we perform them. Uh, that didn't work out. I didn't, for whatever reason, I wasn't able to complete that. And so then once I started, uh, this year I took a short story class um, at school taught by Ms. Craig Owens. And for our final project, our final project coincided with when I started my SYP. So I thought, perfect, two birds with one stone. And I wrote this paper, and I turned it in for short five minutes. Whoa. Uh, OK. That threw me off. Um, so. So I wrote this, and I uh, wrote it for Ms. Craig Owens, and I submitted it, and then I kept editing and revising it, because I didn't get it to the point where I was happy enough with it. And now that it's you know, up here, it is, I, I think it's my best short story. I didn't read it today, because I thought Caterpillar was a little more light, uh, a little more engaging, and you know, it has a happier, funnier ending. Uh, Missing has now become a story where Paul is in love with Sarah, and Sarah is engaged to John. And Paul murders John because he thinks Sarah is asking him to. And then the actual story of Missing, the actual you know, text, takes place where Sarah is finding out that Paul has murdered her fiance. And she you know, can't really come to, come to terms with that. She can't really decide whether Paul is better for her because you know, she does love him, but it's, you know, it's complicated. So I only have five minutes. I'm not going to read the other story that I was going to. Uh, it is written in the second person. It is called How to Be Funny. And the second person is something that I really wanted to toy around with, because I've read uh, a number of stories. How to Be Another Woman uh, is a story that I read that is just you know, fantastic. Um, and I wanted to write in the second person, because it give, you get a real connection when you, instead of reading, like, I was walking down the street, or Tom was walking down the street, when you're reading, you are walking down the street, or walk down the street. Um, Hearing someone telling you to do something really personalizes it. And How to Be Funny, this is a story that, I mean, for me at least, is very personal. Um, it's not necessarily my story, but it's something that you know, I've noticed as I've uh, you know, gotten more into comedy and the theory of comedy. I've been in sketch comedy. I've done uh, improv this year. I find less things funny. I laugh less. Um, I don't know if that's because I'm, I have a fearing, feeling of superiority. I don't know if that's because it, things just aren't funny. I don't know if that's you know, some other reason entirely. But in this story, I toyed around with uh, you know, what, what happens as you want to be funnier and as you get a more sophisticated sense of what your comedy is. And that's really what this story is about. It's about personal comedy, personal accomplishment, personal you know, self-realization. Um, so, what I did for this store, for this project, um, it's different than, you know, a lot of other projects. Um, I'm going to put this back up. It's different than a lot of other projects because for this, there's not, you know, my whole idea for this project was that I was going to write without the influence of others. And I was going to do it without a publisher, without an editor, without even so much as teachers. And it was hard. At the beginning, I just couldn't do it. I wrote Missing, but that was for a class. That was for Miss Craig Owens, and she gave me feedback on that story. So eventually what I had to do is I had to break a little bit. I, you know, I took some time off. I read um, 
the American uh, Best American Short Stories series. I read two editions of those. And I interviewed with uh, Miss Heidi Pittler, who is the wife of Neil Giordano, a teacher here. Um, I emailed with her through him and asked her, you know, what makes something, how do you choose your stories? What makes them the best of a certain year? Um, I read. Um, I read Interpreter of Maladies, a collection by Jhumpa Lahiri that I love. Um, I've read it three times, and it, it you know it's fantastic. I my work was primarily solitary in that I didn't get feedback on it and I didn't want it. But you know, there's only so far I could go. I only had so much. How much time? I thought I had five. OK. Um, so you know, that was really what was the main thing for me, finding a balance between writing without knowing how and writing poorly. Because I don't know how these stories turned out. Like I read Caterpillar at my informal presentation, and it seemed to get a good reception. Uh, people told me they like it. Um, I've given out the link to my wiki a bunch of times now. You know, other than that, the only people I've had read these are my friends after I finish them. And how much can I trust my friends to say objectively, yeah, this is good. Like how much of that is, Charlie, this is really good. And oh yeah, it's good. Your, your story's good. Um, because you know, how much of it is them not wanting to hurt my feelings and how much of it is actually good. That was the, really the hardest part of this experience. Having confidence in myself, them, the changes I was making, and that the stories I was putting out were good. Because, like I said in my abstract, anyone can write. And everyone in this room knows how to write. Everyone in this high school knows how to write. They, you, you start learning to write in kindergarten when you, you know, learn the alphabet and when you learn cursive. But the ability to write well is something that escapes a lot of people, and something that I, you know, tried to learn on my own with this project. So now I'm going to open it up to questions. Um, anybody, if anybody has any questions about these, that would be wonderful. Mr. Goddard. Um, well, uh, what were some of the things that Ms. Pickler said in terms of uh, you know, what made literature good, what made what led her to choose what she helped, you know, she and the authors she's worked with? Um, Something that Ms. Pittler told me that was what I focused on the most when writing these stories is that she knows, I mean, you know, she answered this off of the question that I asked her. I asked her, how do you know? Like, how long before you know whether a story is going to be good or not? And she said, within the first couple minutes, um, within the first page, really, of reading a story, she could be like, all right, like, all right, how to be funny. Be bo oh, nope. Um, so what I had to try to do with this and with all of my stories was really within the first few paragraphs try to give a connection for the reader. Um, try to give a character to connect with, try to give a, like a setting to connect with, um, a mindset to connect with. Like in Caterpillar, um, anybody who has a dog or any pet hopefully we'll be able to have some connection to this story. Um, you know, I read the story and I say that hopefully no one's, uh, I said in my informal, hopefully no one's parents likes their dog more than them. And one of my best friends comes up to me and says, so I know that you didn't say this in your informal, but I, I can tell that you got that inspiration off my life. Like, my parents love my dogs more than me. And I was like, I, I know that they don't, but it's funny that you think that. Um, so she was a person who could really connect with Caterpillar. No one that I know has read How to Be Funny, so hopefully they can connect with that. But that was really the biggest thing that stuck out to me from my uh, talking with her, is that it needs to be something that someone can connect with almost immediately. Yeah? Um, so you talked about how like, you were all writing on your own, you were standing on your own. As you were writing, who exactly were you writing for? Or what did you envision your audience to be? Um, uh, I envisioned. Really, I was writing for me, because no one else is reading these. Uh, this, was, this project was mostly for me. Um, I would love it if people read my stories and liked them, but I like them. I love Caterpillar. How to be funny was really cathartic for me to write. 
Um, missing is, I think, fascinating. I'm really just, you know, so fascinated with myself. That, that was a joke. Um, <laughs> I wrote for me, but also I feel like a lot of these, just because who I am in my situation right now, I'm a high school senior. These are stories that high schoolers are probably going to identify with more than, you know, 35-year-olds sitting in uh, Starbucks reading New York Times. Um, so my audience is definitely me and people like me, but you know, specifically high school students. Rosie. Um, I read a lot about the Hunger Games and you know what makes a book good. Uh, I read a whole book on just what makes young adult literature good. And I tried as hard as I could to keep my project from getting contaminated by what I had been reading. Because I feel like so much of it was a guide as to you know, how to write well and how to write for an audience and how to get an audience to like you. I tried as hard as I could to stay away from it. But there are definitely aspects in my story of like, you know, this, like he, a lot of people can connect with the main character in this just because of so many factors that I gave him to be uh, relatable. Um, I don't know if it was intentional or subconscious or, you know, but it definitely happened, but I don't know that I like that it happened. Um, it's something that I would like to change and something that I have been changing. Uh, from Missing to the most recent story that I wrote, the most recent one that I finished was How to Be Funny. Um, I, you know, got way better at editing and revising. I know what to look for. I know where to look for it. I know what's going to be effective to move. I know, you know, the type of details as I go through that I need to pay attention to. Like in the first draft of Missing that I uh, rewrote, I was mostly paying attention to like, you know, commas and apostrophes and uh, quotation marks. As the first draft of How to Be Funny that I edited, I was focusing on would this passage go better elsewhere? What big changes can I make to this that, you know, set me up to be successful as I keep editing? So I got better at it. I didn't get good enough at it. Um, and hopefully I will continue to improve as I keep writing short stories. Did that answer your question? OK, cool. Uh, Mr. So you talked about how when you basically your writing process you just sit down and write the whole first draft. Did you, how did you come to get that process? Did you experiment at all as you were like, starting writing? Um, well, it, re like, it varied from story to story of what I was writing. Well, I mean, obviously, but like, you know, like I said, um, with the uh, story ideas, like some are you know, the thoughts of a bride, and, a bride and groom before, during, and after their wedding. They either contradict or add to the, you know, overall mood of the wedding. Some of them are that, and some of them are first lines to the stories. Like, I wonder what, light, what choices I made that led me to my job as an assistant manager at the LaGuardia Airport at Dunkin' Do at the LaGuardia Airport Dunkin' Donuts. Um, that's actually a story that, idea that I had when I met someone. I was flying to uh, Maryland, or to D.C., to go to an interview at the University of Maryland. And I was getting a Dunkin' Donuts. It was like 5 in the morning. I was getting a nice coffee. And I just sat down and had this nice chat with the manager there. Uh, he seemed like a nice guy. And I was like, huh, I wonder what, you know, how he got there. Um, but to answer your question, uh, it really depended on how, what kind of story I was writing, whether it was a first sentence story or an overall theme story. Uh, but really, I mean, it's the same as how I write sketch comedy, which is that I sit down and I write it. And good or bad, I write it. Unless it's really bad, in which case I just toss it aside. Uh, have you tried, I know you were focusing on your digital literature. Uh, have you tried writing like, from a 50-year-old perspective or the opposite of that, like a 5 or 10-year-old point of view? Um, in Caterpillar, it is a, uh, you know, it's a teenager. In How to Be Funny, it's, you know, it starts with uh, birth, and it 
proceeds up until the person is 50 years old. Um, so I wrote, this is a story that I really liked that I wanted to read just because I connect with it so personally and because it, I think it shows a different writing style that I achieved and it, you know, I was able to write from different perspectives of like an elementary schooler, middle schooler, high schooler, college student, 50 year old. I skipped a lot of years. Anything else? Cool. Thank you very much. Um, so I know that now, I guess technically, this part of 